let's go ahead and go. Thank you. Okay. Hi, everyone. So we are going to do a Q&A about more technical physics and mathematics issues related to our Fundamental Theory of Physics project. Um, and uh, it'll be primarily me and Jonathan Gorod who'll be um, trying to answer all those difficult technical questions. Um, I might say that at 4 p.m. Eastern time, we will be doing another Q&A about philosophical kinds of questions uh, where we'll cover more general interest sorts of things. Uh, what we'll be doing here will probably may get quite technical and um, we'll make some effort to try and explain what we're talking about, but it might get, um, uh, it may be one of those, look it up on the web if you don't know what the word means type, type stories. Okay, let's get going. So uh, let's see, do we have um, a first question? Um, okay, so a question from Kevin on Twitter. Does this model resolve the Bell paradox? I don't see how causal mechanisms can handle quantum interference between branches. Um, okay, I, I might also comment that we've written um, some Q and A's um, that uh, address some of these questions. So uh, Bell's theorem uh, in quantum mechanics, I think Jonathan wrote that Q and A, so maybe I'll pass this to him for, a, for an answer to that question. Uh, yeah, sure. So um, I'm hoping you guys can see me. We're, we're trying to debug the video setup. Let me know if you can't. Um, so the way that you get a resolution of well, the, the way that you can prove compatibility between our models and Bell's theorem is uh, the proof works in, in largely the same way as it does in, in uh, other kind of deterministic non-local theories of quantum mechanics, like the De Broglie-Bohm uh, uh, sort of um, inter interpretation, the, the the pilot wave interpretation. So the essential idea is we generalize the notion of causality from merely kind of causality in terms of space-like locality, which is normally how you think about it in, in, sort of in the context of relativity, to this notion of causality in, in terms of branch-like uh, locality uh, or branch-like causality. So uh, if, if you've read uh, sort of Stephen's um, announcement post or his, or his technical introduction, you'll be familiar with this concept of, of what we call the multi-way causal graph. So this is a, a generalization of a space-time causal graph where it has uh, causal connections, not only between uh, different sort of updating events on the same branch of multi-way evolution, but also causal connections between updating events on distinct branches of multi-way evolution. And so then, uh, so, so the idea is therefore you can have uh, events causally influencing, influencing each other, not only because they're close together in space, but also because they're, they're close together in branchial space in this more abstract structure, which we, which we have various kind of uh, conjectures about the, the limiting case of, of branchial space becoming effectively a projective Hilbert space, as you'd uh, sort of expect in, in standard quantum mechanics. And so it turns out that, that gives you a, effectively a spatially non-local uh, correlation between uh, in, in your hypergraphs that's sufficient to prove a uh, violation of the CHSH inequality and therefore to, uh, to, to, to uh, sort of prove consistency with Bell's theorem. Um, one thing about quantum interference, just while I remember, so, so the, again, there's a, there's a Q and A answer I, I wrote on the, on the website about this. But um, the basic way that that works is okay in the context of say a double slit experiment. Um, what you can have is a multi-way system where effectively on one multi-way evolution branch the photon goes through one slit, one multi-way evolution branch where the photon goes through the other slit. Then when you apply this completion procedure, that this, this process of, of performing a quantum measurement, where effectively you define equivalences between states on those multi-way branches, the, when you define those equivalences, they, those allow for new states in the multi-way evolution graph to be reached. And in the case of something like a double slit experiment, those correspond exactly to the interference states where the photon essentially went through both slits and interfered with itself. That's, that's a kind of a, a very terse summary of how interference works within our model. I mean, we can go into more detail if you guys are interested. Hey, Jonathan, is there a, a place in your quantum mechanics paper where you discuss this more formally? Yes, yeah, there is. Uh, hang on, let me actually pull up a, a section reference if I can in just Well, why don't you pull up the paper? Yep, right, hang on. Uh, you want to do that okay. or shall I yep. pull it up? No, I can, I can share screen, hang on. Okay, hopefully that's now visible. Um, okay, so the proof of compatibility with Bell's theorem. Um, this is, well, hang on, we can do a search for CHSH. Um, so th so the, the, yeah, okay, the proof of compatibility with Bell's theorem is in this section, uh, 3.4, Bell's theorem, particles and consequences of multi-way relativity. 
And uh, basic notions of interference are actually introduced much earlier than this when we, when we first discuss this notion of the multi-way evolution graph and, uh, and, and sort of this completion procedure that observers perform. So basically the whole of section three can at some level be thought of as, as introducing formally this idea of interference between, between distinct multi-way branches. So yeah, uh, if you want to know more about this specifically, definitely check out uh, section three of, the, of my quantum mechanics paper. Okay, all right, let's go on to the next, um, next thing here. Uh, okay, Adam on Twitter says, um, mentioned possible physical experiments towards the beginning. Uh, it's unclear what is testable from the model given computational irreducibility. What finding would strengthen or weaken this framework? Okay, well, let me take that a little bit. So, so the issue is computational irreducibility implies that if we want to know the detailed outcome of the specific evolution of the rule, that's irreducibly difficult to find. One of the big surprises in this whole project is the thick layer of reducibility that sort of sits on top of sort of the, the uh, structural flexibility of this model. So in other words, and, and in fact, in retrospect, I think this is to be expected because it's that computational reducibility that allows us as sort of human observers to have a chance of making sense of the world. If everything we saw happen in the world involved computational irreducibility to understand, we would have a hard time kind of making sort of general statements about the world. So I think the, um, uh, in terms of, of physical consequences, I think we should distinguish probably two, maybe three kinds. Um, one is, well, something like relativity or sort of our quantum analogs of relativity. These are generic results. These don't depend on details of the rule. These, these things about the interplay between quantum mechanics and relativity, these are all generic. And so there are likely to be statements about, for example, some of the dynamics of black holes and so on that can follow in a way that doesn't depend on the underlying rule. I think we also think it's likely that there are statements about uh, quantum computing, maybe some statements about repeated quantum measurements that might be amenable to experimental observation uh, in the short term that again, might be quite generic. Then there's a whole class of things that, uh, th there's a class of things that are probably extremely specific to the particular underlying rule, maybe particle masses, I'm not sure. As I say, I think an intermediate case is uh, gauge groups where I'm sort of hoping that there will be some results that can be gotten that will be a little bit more generic, just as I, I would expect that there's a large class of rules that will give uh, integer dimensional space as a limit. Um, I suspect there's a large class of rules that will give a Lie group as the local gauge group as a limit. Now, maybe we can talk a little bit about um, uh, quantum, uh, quantum experiments and the possibility of, of directly accessible kind of, um, uh, I, I should say another thing. For, for example, this idea about oligons, these, these uh, ultra light particles, this is something which sort of interesting in terms of its prediction status, because it's, it's not something where we can nail it and say, okay, given this rule, there's this particular thing. It's just, there is a, sort of an easy possibility to see why there will be much lighter particles. They might not exist. It might be that the first sort of solution, I mean, we can think of these particles as being like solutions to some kind of generalized equation that represents the possibility of locality in, um, in, in these, um, uh, so, so I mean, to be a little bit more formal, you know, I've always viewed, for example, in cellular automata, the existence of localized structures as being like solving some sort of generalized Diophantine equation with respect to the uh, evolution operator that represents the cellular automaton. And we can see, expect the same kind of thing that these localized particles are some kind of um, uh, sort of eigen solution to some kind of evolution operator in the, in the hypergraph. Um, and it is certainly conceivable that the first solution could be of size 10 to the 35, but it seems more likely that there are solutions much smaller than that. And that's a statement that we couldn't prove that mathematically, but if we just are used to looking at Diophantine equations, it's a rare Diophantine equation whose smallest solution is of order 10 to the 35. So that's kind of where that, where that sort of intuition comes from. And that's a, that's a, a funny kind of prediction because we're not saying we know the particular number, um, nor are we saying it's a generic prediction that is something to do like uh, 
the, the validity of Einstein's equations or something like this. But maybe we can talk, Jonathan, maybe we can chat a little bit about some possible nearer term quantum uh, measurements and, um, and predictions and so on. Sure. So, um, okay. So, yeah. So, so one example of a prediction that seems to be relatively generic, at least if our sort of current model of how quantum mechanics works in these models is correct, is uh, a bunch of results with regards to quantum information theory and kind of quantum computational complexity theory that Stephen sort of alluded to. So, um, so one example of a, of a result is, okay, so, so uh, uh, as some of you will know, kind of our our one way of modeling quantum quantum measurement within our models is you take this multi-way evolution graph and you apply these you, you you make equivalences between different branches so that effectively that the the, the effective multi-way evolution collapses down to have, to have a single thread of time and this is uh, in some sense equivalent to this process of, of kind of walling off certain quantum states by constructing a, a sort of curved measurement frame that, that Stephen mentioned earlier uh, in the uh, in the live stream yesterday so um, this procedure if it's correct, if this is a correct model of quantum measurement, make certain predictions about computational complexity. So here's, a, here's an example of a definite one. Um, the structure of the multi-way evolution graph gives you actually, I think, in my opinion, a really, really clean intuition for the distinction between a, Turing, a, a standard classical Turing machine, a non-deterministic Turing machine, and a quantum Turing machine. Because if you think of every multi-way branch as corresponding to a, a sort of, a, as performing a computation, then a classical deterministic Turing machine is effectively following one single multi-way branch in accordance with a, with a sort of completely predictable deterministic rule. A non-deterministic Turing machine is uh, effectively following multi-way branches. Again, it's, it's following a single multi-way branch, but where the path is, sel is selected by some non-deterministic rule. Finally, a quantum Turing machine is the whole multi-way evolution graph itself, right? It's evolving a linear superposition of, of different eigenstates, which you can think of as being the different sort of microstates on, on, each, uh, on each branch of the, of the multi-way evolution graph. But the point is, you know, in standard, in, in the way people usually think about quantum computing, one of the hard things about it is, um, and the reason why it, you, it's not quite correct to just think of quantum computers as being like kind of exponentially parallelized versions of classical computers is because you have to set up the initial conditions of the computation really, really carefully so that all the different eigenstates where you got basically the wrong answer have amplitude so they all exactly cancel out. And by the end, you're just left with one eigenstate that gives you the right answer. And that's why quantum computers are kind of so hard to program conceptually. We have exactly the same problem here, right? So you, you, what you have to have, you, you have your multi-way evolution graph, but you still have to perform a measurement on it to collapse it down to a single evolution history so that you get a single classical result as the outcome of your computation. Well, when you do that, there's a, there's a fancy mathematical way of thinking about this, which is called the Knuth-Bendix completion procedure. And basically, and so at a mathematical level, what happens is the transition monoid that is the analog of a transition function for a quantum Turing machine if you apply the Knuth-Bendix completion procedure to this finitely presented transition monoid, it reduces it to a finite transition function, and the space of, uh, of quantum states of the, of the Turing machine collapses down to a classical Turing, uh, state, uh, space of states for, for an ordinary Turing machine. And this, th this has immediate implications for effectively the extent to which the complexity classes of P and BQP, that is sort of classical polynomial time and bounded error quantum polynomial time, can be related. And as far as I'm aware, uh, it, it's, it's sort of um, this is one of the, 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 the most concrete predictions that we're able to make, is that we, we actually have bounds on the extent to which P and PQP can actually be related. And that's potentially one way of verifying and or falsifying uh, sort of the, at least our model of quantum mechanics, if not the whole underlying model. But, you know, one of the things there is that the, the, my concern and issue with that is that in the end, the, um, you know, the parameters that enter the BQP, you know, uh, uh, P comparison will end up being things about maximum entanglement speeds. And those maximum entanglement speeds are, appear to be very, very far away from what um, your average physicist with a you know, cryostat can, can achieve. Do you have any comments on that yet? Yes, I mean, it, it, this is kind of the problem. So yeah, it, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, the, it, this experiment is in principle possible to do, but because the, you know, the maximum entanglement speed is kind of phenomenally huge, um, it's entirely conceivable that the kinds of computations you would need to do in order to be able to effectively distinguish P and BQP within a within a real quantum computer are sort of so extreme that they are completely out of the you know, out out of current experimental range. Without knowing more about the particular details of the rule and without having better sort of dimensional analysis of uh, you know estimating quantum entanglement rates and how they relate to quantum computing rates, which we haven't really done, we have some ideas about, but we haven't really done that in detail yet. Uh, until we have that, 
it's it's kind of hard to say, but it's at least it's one it's one avenue of experimental verification that is at least in principle possible. So for another live stream, we'll talk about quantum computing and its relationship to all of this. This will be fun. All right, let's keep going here. We've got gosh, we've got a lot of questions here. Okay, um, Cyril on Facebook: Distances have to be large compared to individual hypergraph connections, but small compared to the whole size of the hypergraph. If distances grow larger, do you see deviations from one over I guess that's R squared rules as currently observed for galaxy rotations and modeled by dark matter or entropic gravity um, uh, 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 in the style of Mond type theories. So, okay, uh, interesting question. So the question there is, is the inverse square law of gravity going to be violated by um, things happening? So of course you have to realize, you know, the uh, uh, gravity in, uh, you know, in, in, in standard relativity, in standard general relativity, one's not, it's not inverse square all the way down the line, so to speak. Um, you know, that, that's a, um, uh, but I think a question, um, um, a question for us is, so for example, having the Schwarzschild solution, which does have one over R squared gravity, um, you know, having the Schwarzschild solution be, um, uh, you know, reproduced in our in our setup. Um, I think that's that's. Let me see. I mean, what to say about this? Um, okay, the current. I had originally thought maybe this deviation from three dimensional space would be something that would be uh, readily visible in sort of cosmology or astrophysics today, and that's still conceivable. In fact. My other thought is that there may be a way to reformulate general relativity in terms of sort of tiny dimension change rather than curvature change. Um, we don't know that yet. That's an interesting mathematical direction. We just don't know yet. Um, I think uh, um, uh, the, um, the question of, of um, um, well, let's see. And I, I mean, my current thinking is that on the dark matter question that these kind of very light particles are a more immediately plausible thing to look at when it comes to that rather than, I mean, it would always be my, my suspicion that the whole dark matter story would turn out to be a problem with general relativity, but I'm getting less convinced about that and more convinced that there might just be some sort of particle oriented solution. But Jonathan, do you have a comment? I, I do not know about entropic gravity. So do you know about that? I, I know a little bit. I know a bit more about Mond. So Mond is this, this modified Newtonian gravity idea or modified Newtonian dynamics, this idea that there could be, yeah, that there could be macroscopic deviations from one over R square that, that sort of at, uh, at, the, at the level of superclusters and things. So actually, um, the way that we've derived general relativity, or at least the way that we currently understand general relativity within our models, does imply that there could be something, there could be some higher order correction to, to, the, to the Einstein field equations that would be not unlike the Mond approach. So Stephen's already mentioned that, that possibly one of the most fruitful uh, avenues for, for kind of investigating this dark matter problem is through these oligon particles. But there is at least another possibility that uh, I think is also definitely worthy of further investigation, which are these higher order corrections. So um, in, okay. Hey, let, in let me try that because that, that's, a, that's yeah. a good point. But let, let's, okay, you know, I, I can, I can sure. give that a try. I mean, I think, you know, that, for example, long ago, I worked on deriving uh, fluid mechanics from underlying molecular dynamics of simple cellular automaton-like particles. Um, what you find when you do that is there's leading terms that have to do with con continuity of fluids. The next order term has to do with viscosity of fluids. And there are higher order terms that represent other kinds of detailed features of fluids that are often more sensitive to the details of what particular molecules exist in your fluid. Now, the Einstein equations, as we've derived them, uh, you know, make use of only that sort of first order non-trivial term. And I think, Jonathan, I don't know whether you ever did this. And did you do this in your paper? Did you get a higher order term in your paper or not? Yes. Yeah. Or at least I got a, I got a plausible form for one. Yeah. The, okay. And what does it look like? You want, you want to show it? What, what is uh, it? Yeah. Yeah. So I can. So it actually, it has the, basically the same form as um, this higher order correction that exists in this thing called Lovelock gravity. Oh, actually, sorry, just before I show the paper, let me, let me add one thing to, to Stephen's fluid dynamics uh, point. So it turns out this, this analogy is far deeper than, than either, I think, well, certainly than I expected and possibly far deeper than Stephen expected as, as well. This, this notion of when you, you know, when you go from discrete hypergraph dynamics to derive you know, continuous general relativity, it's like going from discrete molecular dynamics to, to sort of continuum fluid mechanics. 
it turns out exactly, basically at a mathematical level, exactly the same thing happens and you get the higher order corrections in exactly the same way. So in fluid mechanics, what you do, um, if, you want to, uh, if you want to recover the Euler equations, what you, you basically you take the, the, stress the total stress tensor that exists in the Navier-Stokes equations and you decompose it into a trace part and a trace free part. And then, so, so then the, uh, the, the, the trace free part is your shear stress and that you kind of assume you, you just, you don't care about that's the higher order correction. And then the trace part manifests as this hydrostatic pressure, which then appears in the Euler equations. But then when you want to compute higher order corrections to the Euler equations, you then have to add back in the contributions from the, from the trace free part from the, from the shear stress. Turns out exactly the same thing happens in our derivation of general relativity. So what you do is you take this complete uh, discrete Riemann curvature tensor that we derive, which is this, you know, this, this higher order tensor, and then you decompose it into a trace part and a trace free part. And then so the, 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 tra the trace part is then the, the Ricci curvature tensor that appears in the Einstein equations. And the trace free part is this vial curvature that kind of that incorporates the uh, information, not just about the volumes of the geodesic bundles, but about the shapes of the geodesic bundles as well. So the ordinary Einstein field equations only put constraints on the Ricci curvature. They, do, they, they leave the vial curvature completely unconstrained. But our derivation at least leaves open the possibility of there existing these higher order corrections that also put constraints on the vial curvature. And one possibility, we haven't looked at it in detail, is that these effectively correspond to deviations from, from large scale Newtonian dynamics and that we might, have, we might be able to see cosmological consequences of that. Let me see if I can quickly yeah, find One piece of intuition that's quite useful, I think, is, is that what the Einstein equations say, if, if you have a bundle of GD6, um, the, you know, the overall area of the GD6, uh, of the GD6 bundle is given by the Ricci scalar, but the, you know, when you look at the shape of the GD6 bundle and how the shape of the GD6 bundle varies, that probes higher order pieces of kind of the curvature, the, 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 of, of curvature tensors and so on. And so the, you know, the, the traditional statement of the Einstein equations is saying that essentially the area of this geodesic bundle is, um, is not changing. But there, if you have sort of higher order pieces, that's talking about different kinds of deformations that are and aren't possible in the geodesic bundle. Okay, let's see, let's see Jonathan's papers. Let's see, let's see the tensors. Oh, okay, sure. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay, so th this is the standard derivation of the Einstein equations, but then we, we note that this derivation is basically, okay, so in, in fluid mechanics, you have this Boltzmann equation. Uh, uh, you, you're basically, you're, you're, you're starting from the Boltzmann equation for the, or the, you're starting from the one particle distribution function uh, for, uh, and its Boltzmann equation. And from that, you're, tr you're performing this thing called the chapman enskog hydrodynamic expansion, which is basically just a kind of, uh, it's the tensor analog of a power series. You're basically expanding in some, in some small parameter epsilon and then you use this to derive the continuum Navier-Stokes equations. And basically what I show is that if you do exactly the same thing, but now this, instead of the, uh, the uh, one, part, one particle distribution uh, function, you, you use this, uh, this function that I call C, which is effectively the, this is the, the, the volume of a, of a cone, of a space-time cone in the causal graph, and you treat this as like the kind of hypergraph uh, distribution function. Then uh, you, you end up deriving uh, the Einstein equations in effectively the same way, but you also, but in addition, so this this piece here contains the standard Einstein equations, but there are also these higher order corrections that turn out to have the same form as this thing called the Lovelock theory of gravity, at least in in, in some approximation. So these are these correspond to higher order contractions of the Riemann curvature um, that, that place additional constraints on this quantity here, which is the vial curvature, and this has potentially makes predictions about things like gravitational waves and about um, and about, about how kind of galaxies uh, inter can interact gravitationally on very large scales. But we don't, as I say, we don't yet have sort of quantitative results for, for exactly. What, what is the works. dimensional analysis of alpha, beta, and gamma? Do we know the order of magnitude of those correction terms from dimensional uh, analysis? This is a good. So, so for um, we know that alpha and beta are very very small. <laughs> that's that's about. Yeah, but, but are they dimensionally different from gamma? There. That I would need to check. I. Uh, okay. Anyway. All right. I, yeah, I can, I can look into that. I don't know. Right. The. Okay. So interesting question. All right. Um. Let's see. Let's keep going here. Olav on Twitter. Um, relational and discrete model. Does special and general relativity appear naturally with some rule sets? Yeah, the answer to that we, we talked about at some length. Whenever there is this phenomenon of causal invariance, uh, and then you get special relativity, when you, in addition, require that space be finite dimensional, then you get general relativity. And that there are probably some sort of uh, 
detailed mathematical footnotes that might be appropriate to put in there about the way that limits work. I think that um, as we think about deriving things like general relativity, um, it's a stack of many kinds of limits. The, the, we're dealing with uh, length scales large compared to the elementary length, the, the distance between uh, nodes in the hypergraph. We're dealing with time scales large compared to the elementary time we're dealing with, but yet these things have to be small compared to the overall size of the hypergraph and so on. There's a stack of limits that um, uh, there's certainly more mathematics to be done in, in really uh, nailing down exactly what, uh, what kinds of um, uh, sequence of limits and interchange of orders of limits and so on have to, have to be made. But yes, with, with, with those, uh, with, with some as yet unknown sort of perhaps pedantic or perhaps important mathematical footnotes, it follows as soon as you have a model with the structure of ours um, and you have causal invariance and you have this requirement of um, uh, finiteness of dimension of space, and you have this additional requirement of essentially computational irreducibility, which is, I think, one of the one of the easiest to achieve requirements. Then general relativity follows um, with these uh, uh, even potential higher order terms that Jonathan was just mentioning. Um, get specific. Does it predict gravity galaxy rotation non arbitrarily? No. I mean, to to work out the rotation of a galaxy you're basically solving some n-body problem with, uh, uh, with some gravitational force law. And the, the thing that Jonathan was just mentioning is maybe there is some correction to the gravitational force law that will be implied by these higher order terms in the Einstein equations. Remember, remember the, the, the big story here is we can derive the Einstein equations. Normally the Einstein equations are just a thing you put into a theory. So there's no possibility of saying we can derive them and we can derive higher order corrections. It's just these are the equations, now go solve them. Um, as in fluid mechanics, you know, the anal analog in fluid mechanics to the Einstein equations are the Navier-Stokes equations, but the Navier-Stokes equations are something that you expect to be deriving from small scale molecular dynamics. So for example, when in, in an extreme case in hydrodynamics, when you are close to the speed of sound, and you start forming shocks in a fluid, it is no longer the case that the Navier-Stokes equations, which assume a purely continuum fluid and ignore the, the presence of molecules, they don't apply anymore. And so you have to make corrections to those equations. And I must say that I had long thought um, that when one had extreme gravitational situations close to singularities and curvature and things like that, um, that one would similarly see that, that it would turn out that the Einstein equations were just an approximation in the same way that the Navier-Stokes equations are just an approximation to the true dynamics of a, of a, of a fluid made of, made of molecules. And I guess that, that um, what, one of the exciting things here is that we have the serious possibility of deriving those higher order corrections to the Einstein equations on the basis of the underlying discrete model. Okay, let's see. F speech on Hacker News. Could I understand the effort this way? In general, any Turing complete uh, set of computational rules should be able to generate any computable expression, and hopefully physics can be expressed with computable expressions, at least if it is to be comprehensible to humans. So you're looking for a particular set of rules instead of the English language and math symbols that meet certain kinds of aesthetics. Do you expect only valid physics to be expressed, or is the research on the kind of restriction that will lead to only valid physics being expressed? Okay, that, that might be better in our philosophy Q&A later, but, but let me try and um, say something about that. The, um, uh, in the first sort of explanation of what we're trying to do, it's find a rule where we can go work out its consequences and match them up with no and existing physics. Now, if you peel that back a bit, it gets a little bit more complicated because what does it mean to match them up with existing physics? It could be that there's a different description for the universe that isn't, doesn't happen to follow existing physics, but is also a valid description of the universe. And that's what, when we talk about this kind of rule space relativity, that's what we're talking about is looking, finding a different description language, which is also a valid description language for the universe that we can then match up with. And in the end, the one sort of unchanging constraint is that these description languages correspond to a universe that is, in a sense, just a Turing complete universe. But so, so the, the um, uh, I would say that the main thing 
that should be considered the, the core of the project right now is we built up physics over the last 300 years or so, roughly. I mean, that's the main, main development of physics as it exists today, kind of started with Galileo and Newton and so on. And that means we've got a summary that works for us humans, although it's pretty difficult to work with. It's really non-trivial to work out consequences of general relativity or consequences of quantum field theory, but it's something where we've got a sort of a human path to working out things about the universe. We've summarized the universe in terms of existing physics. What we want to do is to find essentially a, a rule that reproduces that existing summary of existing physics. Um, whether there is a completely different way to describe the universe that would be appropriate if we had completely different senses, if we were, if we were dealing with completely different kinds of things, this is sort of more of a philosophical issue, but th then we would want to describe that with a different rule. Yes, that is likely to be the case. And that's what this rule space relativity is about. And uh, I have to say, we're, we're, we're only slowly, I mean, that was a, a very new realization that that rule space relativity idea um, was, was out there. And we're just, I think, starting to grapple with, with what the real consequences of that are. All right, let's see. Um, okay, question from Jeffrey Sims. Why stop hypergraphs at two edges? Is there a series of N edge hypergraphs to be considered? Um, Okay, is there a chance the basic graphs can be renormalized into colored and or weighted graphs? Is it possible to considering? Uh, okay, let, let's, let's take those first, okay? So the equivalence between different, um, uh, different kinds of, um, of graphs, yes, absolutely. You can, so a lot of what, let's see if I can share the screen here. Um, a lot of, um, um, I tried to, to talk about that a bit in section seven here, um, equivalence. Uh, so um, there, is, there is equivalence between um, both. So, so first of all, we are often considering hypergraphs where there's a hyper edge that is a ternary hyper edge, for example, that we're representing like that. It's an ordered ternary hyper edge. But there are there are lots of different formulations that one can give of this. So for example, one that was actually my earlier formulation from the 1990s was trivalent graphs. And there's, there's a, ultimately, you can represent any trivalent graph transformation rule in terms of hypergraphs and vice versa, um, but with more and more complicated constraints to, to make sure that you, uh, you, you stay in the same class of graphs or hypergraphs. But yes, the, the, one of the things that was sort of disappointing to me to discover is the stuff that I was doing in the 1990s on trivalent graphs, it basically gives exactly the same results as we now get with this, in my opinion, more elegant formalism with elements, relations, hypergraphs, and so on. But yes, there's a, there's a close correspondence between, between all of these kinds of things. So N-edge hypergraphs, I think that that is what we're, what we're talking about here is a hypergraph with, with, with for example, um, you know, ternary edges or whatever else. Um, Let's see, is there a chance the basic graphs can be renormalized into colored and or weighted graphs? So yes, there are, um, in fact, this is yet another model here, which again, I talk about the equivalence. This is, this is a kind of an ordering uh, scheme where each node kind of has, has an order to the edges around it, um, but the edges themselves don't have directedness. So that's just another kind of, kind of graph-like thing. Could you do this with colored edges? Uh, I'm, I think the answer is definitely yes. Haven't actually done it. I encourage you to, to do it. Um, you should be able to see the correspondence. And um, Why do we care about all these different reformulations? The answer is, in the end, we're going to be enumerating possible rules. And these different reformulations, while ultimately equivalent, will enumerate the rules in different orders. So it could, it could be that a sort of colored network model will be the one that enumerates in the order that lets us find rules for physics uh, sort of earlier in the ordering than, uh, than something based on hypergraphs, for instance. We just don't know that yet. Um, I have been, was really keen on this elements and relations approach because I just think it's, it's very clean and it sort of meets my criteria of aesthetics. Uh, the universe might not agree with me, so to speak. It might be that for the universe, the, the, you know, the colored graphs are the ones that are uh, would enumerate most easily. Uh, so another piece of this question, is it possible to consider a single ordering of updates randomly selected 
from full branchial space and create a stochastic hidden variables theory uh, where that is the only state that happened? Okay, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, we have actually in our, uh, we have this Wolf model function that, let's see if we can pull that up here. Uh, tools, let's see. Uh, this is Max's code and um, uh, guide to functions. And I will show you. Uh, so here's this function. And um, this has, um, uh, yeah, I think we can look at it here. Um, this has the, where is it? Event ordering function. How to order possible updating events. So the event ordering function determines exactly what you're talking about. And one possible setting for the event ordering function is random, okay? And so that means that in, that, in, in the usual way, when we run these models, we're usually only, okay, before we look at multi-way systems, we are just looking at a particular ordering, but this allows one to try out random orderings. And so the question, the, um, uh, this, you're absolutely right, that uh, that's, a, that's a good point actually, that, um, uh, stochastic hidden variables theory would correspond exactly to you're picking a you're randomly picking a single path through the multiway system. Now, an interesting question is whether some of the work by I don't know you know Nelson and those guys um, on on um, stochastic hidden variables um, whether we can specifically apply some of the mathematical ideas from that to the case of a a stochastically chosen branch in a multiway system. How about Jonathan? Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, not really. Um, I, one thing I would say, by the way, is that uh, another way you, you, can, uh, you can effectively apply a, a sort of stochastic event selection process is using our multi-way system code with an event selection function set to random. And, and so then, so we're, Max's Wolfram model code uh, does effectively generational uh, evolution updates. So you're applying kind of uh, maximally uh, consistent uh, sort of sets of space-like separated updating events. The multi-way system code works in a fundamentally different way. It, it, it only applies one updating event at a time. And so then if you want to apply genuinely a, a completely random updating event for a given hypergraph, uh, you can use the multi-way system code uh, in, in order to do that and actually visualize the whole, whole evolution tree. Uh, the question of whether we can get a stochastic um, hidden variable interpretation by using effectively uh, you know, random event selection functions, as Stephen says, it's an interesting idea. It's not one uh, that we've really considered, um, but possibly a live stream. A good discussion. topic for a, a live stream. Let's let's find yeah. the world's expert on stochastic um, hidden variables and let's get them to join us and we'll talk about that. It's a good idea and it's a, it would be a good thing to analyze. Um, and maybe maybe the person who asked this question is an expert on this, in which case, please let us know and we'd love to, to chat with you further. Okay. Next question here was uh, uh, an unpronounceable handle here. So sorry, un one C ROM. Age old continuous versus discrete question remains. Can this model account for what some believe are continuous phenomena? Yeah, the, the answer is yes, we absolutely think so. And essentially that's happening through this limiting process, just like discrete molecules bouncing around can appear to be a continuous fluid in standard uh, uh, statistical mechanics. So we have the same kind of limiting process that by the time you have you know, 10 to the 100 nodes in your discrete hypergraph, it behaves an awful lot like a continuous space. Um, and that's the idea. Now, let me mention one very, very bizarre possibility, okay, about con uh, discrete versus continuous. So imagine that the underlying hypergraph is, has an update rule that is continually essentially uh, generating new nodes. So it's continually sort of subdividing space into finer and finer pieces. So here's a bizarre thing that could happen. You could say, I'm an observer of this space. I'm going to go and uh, make a measurement in which I prove that the universe is discrete. But during the time effectively that I'm setting up to prepare that measurement, the universe could have subdivided further. So in a sense, the, the discreteness of the universe is continually receding from you because every time you try and probe it, it's, um, it's getting more fine grained. So that would be a, 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 to me, that would be a very interesting conclusion to the sort of uh, 2000 plus year debate of is the world continuous or discrete is, well, it's actually discrete, but you'll never know it because every time you try to probe that discreteness, it's going to subdivide and get away from you. 
and it kind of amuses me that um, I never was a big fan of epsilon delta proofs in calculus, but it's a, it's a literal, the universe is literally doing one of those epsilon delta proofs and showing that it is a continuous limit. Jonathan, it looked like you had some comment on this. The, no, 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 I just, I really like that explanation. That was all, that was, that the, was good. <laughs> okay. All right, next question from Joe Crowley. Um, where are the spinners? Yes, we, we are about to go look for the spinners. Um, the, uh, uh, for, so, um, I mean, that is a, a very, uh, the question of what the effective rotation group is for, um, for particles, basically, and whether that is SO3 or SU2, um, and how we get the spinner representations out and so on, that is actually, that is going to be one of our first uh, working session live streams is talking about spin and spinners and so on. Uh, uh, Jonathan thought he had some partial answer to that, but um, um, I'm not sure. Uh, we're, we're not yet sure about that. Uh, do, you want to, do you want to say something about that, Jonathan? Uh, yeah, sure. So one, yeah, okay. as Stephen kind of mentioned, we, we, the, the answer is we don't know. But one way that you can get mathematical objects that are actually very much like spinners um, is actually, is, is a, it's a very natural thing when you consider the geometry of branchial space. Because, so as Stephen was talking about yesterday, when you look at these different branch-like hypersurfaces that kind of divide up your, your multi-way evolution graph, you can look at how uh, geodesics in, the, in, in, these, in, in branchial space uh, are turned as a result of the action of the multi-way system. And that turning gives you a kind of angle, and that turns out to be the angle that we think sort of enters into, the, into our derivation of the, of the path integral. But here's an interesting thing. So in general, these multi-way systems, they grow over time, right? They, they, very often they grow exponentially or even super exponentially. So one branch-like hypersurface could be much larger than the previous one. The result is that actually it means that things can turn through much larger angles than you'd normally expect them to be able to turn through. And so what, you know, okay, one geometrical intuition for what a spinner is, is it's like, okay, you have a vector space and it's equipped with a representation of the spin group. And then what you have are these spinners, which are elements of the vector space, with, but with this bizarre property that when you turn them around by 360 degrees, they negate. So in fact, you have to turn them 720 degrees to get back to where you started from. So there's some kind of square root of ordinary geometrical vectors. It turns out those are a very natural thing in branchial space because you can have objects that, are, that appear to turn through 360 degrees and be facing in the other direction, effectively because the branchial space is continuously expanding. And so the, the, the hope is this will give us some intuition about the nature of spin. Uh, we, as I say, we, I think Stephen and I both have uh, conjectures about what spin might be. We might discuss them later on, but uh, that's something we still need to figure out. Right. This is this is this is a great topic for one of our working session live streams coming soon. Um, okay. Uh, next question from Ke. Um, Ke. Ke. -e. Um, can we derive the Feynman path integral formalism from the theory? Yes. Yes. We 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 believe so, and it's very beautiful. And it's basically, it's kind of, I think it's fair to say, it's kind of the analog of Einstein's equations in branchial space. I mean, that's kind of the way to think about it. It's the effect that Lagrangian density has on GD6 in much the same way that uh, in the standard Einstein equations uh, are talking about sort of the effect that uh, energy momentum has on GD6. Um, I don't know whether we can, I mean, I think, Jonathan, I think you have a, a pretty formal der derivation of the path integral in your paper, is that right? Right, right. So it's, yeah. So, so as Stephen says, I mean, the, these, these multi-way evolution graphs, they're, you know, if you start to think about them intu uh, sort of intuitively, they seem very much like a, like a path integral, right? They are some kind of sum over histories type, type thing. Um, yeah, so, so as Stephen said, if you then try and define um, effectively continuum equations on branchial space, you get some analog, it turns out you get some analog of the Einstein field equations where the, uh, what would normally be the space-time metric tensor is replaced with this object called the Fubini study metric tensor, which is this sort of geometrical object that's used in studying projective Hilbert space. It's kind of the natural curvature metric on projective Hilbert space. And it's used as a way of, of quantifying uh, entanglement distance between quantum states and things like this. And so with this information, you can, effectively, you can equip the, the multi-way evolution graph with this measure, which you can then sum over. And then the claim is that, you know, again, in, uh, uh, using the same assumptions that Stephen mentioned for the Einstein field equation proof, you basically have to assume certain amounts of microscopic randomness in the evolution of multi-way evolution graph. But assuming that happens and assuming you can make some weak ergodicity assumptions, that uh, discrete sum over this measure over the entire multi-way evolution graph converges to an integral, and it converges to an integral with basically the same form as the Feynman path integral. And that's more or less how we think quantum field theory might work in these models. 
You know, one question that came up yesterday from, I think, a question on the live stream was, was um, uh, whether this approach would give one a new way to actually compute and approximate path integrals. And that seems to me to be a rather interesting idea because what we're realizing is that the approach to looking at um, uh, the Einstein equations and looking at space time using these underlying hypergraph models and so on actually gives one ideas about how to do numerical general relativity. And maybe we can, uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's sort of a long-term issue. How do you find good numerical approximations to path integrals? And it's not something one normally does. I mean, one, one can make lattice theory, but that's in Euclidean space-time. And uh, this might give one a way to do, in Minkowski space-time, a way to do a discretization of the path integral. Any comments, Jonathan, on that? The... No, no, that sounds perfectly reasonable. I mean, you, you, yeah, Stephen knows much more about path integrals than I do. Um, I, I, I have a few ideas about how we can use these techniques for doing better numerical GR, but numerical QFT, that's, I think that's that's your ball game. Well, well, what, what, talk about the numerical general relativity case. because Okay, I'll yeah, yeah, sure. So, okay, so actually we, we discovered recently that you had a note to this effect in the NKS book that I had not remembered and apparently neither had you, that, right. uh, that actually these causal graphs might give one a new way of doing, of setting up uh, sort of uh, initial value problems for sort of Hamiltonian GR. So, you know, one of the conventional ways that you would do that, okay, one of the reasons why numerical relativity is hard is uh, normally if you have a system of, you know, hyperbolic equations or something, uh, like in fluid mechanics, and you want to solve them, you, you cast them as a, as a time evolution problem. And you can do that in fluid mechanics and in most equations, but with general relativity, time is part of your metrics, so you can't, there's no obvious way to do that. So what you basically have to do is foliate your space time uh, into these, according to some parameter that's like a kind of fictional time parameter, and then and then do and then define your initial value problem on those hypersurfaces, and that's how these decompositions, like the ADM decomposition and the BSSN decomposition, the people use in numerical general relativity. That's kind of how they work. Causal graphs and this notion of causal graphs that limit to the continuous space times gives you this notion gives you a, a kind of a much less structured way of potentially doing the same of potentially doing the same thing. So you can use a causal graph to, to recast the Einstein equations as a as a sort of initial value problem. Except now, rather than in sort of standard numerical general relativity cases where you have a you know you, you're you have some curvilinear coordinate system, so your neighborhood structure is very well defined. As you know, normally you have every cell in in, in your space, like hypersurface, has six neighbors. Um, in our in the context of our causal graphs, because our degrees are unconstrained, you can have cells which have arbitrary numbers of neighbors, and you can have effectively fluxes coming from arbitrary different directions. So it's a kind of it's a it's a grand generalization of these techniques of numerical general relativity that I think is going to be really exciting and potentially really useful for people, for you know, astrophysicists, cosmologists, and and, yeah, and people working in those kinds of fields. And if we can do the same thing for quantum field theory, you know, that's going to be really awesome. You should write up the thing with numerical relativity. That will be really useful <laughs> to people. I'll try. Okay. The, um, somebody is asking, what is Jonathan's background? Okay, Jonathan can, uh, <laughs> yeah, we were just math and computer science. And, you know, no, background, do, do, does he mean, we don't know whether the background is, is the clock or whether he means the background of a, whether this might be spatial or temporal or something. Like <laughs> okay, I'll give very brief answers to both questions because we were actually just before the live stream, we were discussing that I have a thematically relevant background for discussing the nature of time with this big, sort of a giant pocket watch behind me. Um, so, okay, if you meant my academic backgrounds, I, I was sort of, I was trained as a mathematician. Um, I, I, um, my, my background is really in kind of differential geometry and uh, things related to the mathematical foundations of general relativity. So things like, uh, I'm particularly interested in tensor methods and certain techniques for hyperbolic partial differential equations and things like that. Um, but uh, I'm kind of, I have interests all over the place. I, I, I've also done sort of a fair amount of research in areas like uh, computational complexity theory and graph theory and in the foundations of quantum mechanics. And actually the work I do here at, here at Wolfram is in a weird combination of mathematical logic and quantum computing. So I have, um, I have a few, it's kind of nice that, that there have been a few different uh, domains of expertise that I've been able to call on in the course of this project. I think it's really amusing because uh, Jonathan has worked on, as you mentioned, graph theory, general relativity, automated theorem proving, and quantum computing. Those are, those are known areas that, that I know Jonathan's worked on, and they all turn out to be relevant to this project, which, is, uh, which has been rather cool. Okay. Um, uh, what exactly, Andrew on Twitter, reading through this, what exactly are you using for elements in the actual software to display these? Are these just coordinates on the screen you draw a line to each coordinate within a loop. I'm not quite sure what that means. I think, I think you're asking, how do we determine how to actually lay out one of these hypergraphs on the screen? 
we're using uh, sort of, uh, well, it's, it's, it's Wolfram language graph layout, uh, the Wolfram language graph layout system, which in turn is using algorithms with things like spring electrical embedding, where you're imagining that the graph has a bunch of, of nodes which are connected by springs and which electrically repel each other. Um, and one of the issues is sometimes you'll get stuck in a local minimum in, in, because you're, you're making essentially a, an almost physical model of what this graph would be like if it was made from springs and, and electrical repulsion uh, and, and things that were electrically repelling each other. Um, and uh, sometimes you'll get a, a physical, you'll physically be stuck in a, uh, in a state where, which, is not the, um, uh, which is not the true minimum state. And, and you'll see actually, to my great frustration in my paper, for example, there were a few places of foldovers that we had a hard time uh, resolving. We mostly were able to kind of uh, essentially shake the, the sort of physical representation of the graph uh, for purposes of rendering and get the foldover to, to, to not fold over, so to speak, and particularly for, for graphs that have sort of exponential growth as you go towards the edge, that was hard to do. Um, one of the things that we've been interested in is having a more interactive system for understanding these graphs by having them in, in for example, virtual reality. Uh, in fact, we are in the process of building a system, but we'd love to get help on this. Um, it's uh, building a system uh, primarily in Unity game development um, engine where you can actually go into sort of virtual reality and meet your graph and with your hands uh, move pieces of the graph around and have the thing automatically adjust and for real major bonus points, be able to see the evolution of the hypergraph uh, right there in virtual reality and see the thing. Well, one of the things we haven't solved, we tried to solve, we didn't manage to solve it, is if you have a single graph and you want to lay it out, well, that's one thing you can do it with these kind of physically based methods. But if you have a graph which is progressively evolving, being able to have sort of a correct correspondence between different stages in that evolution and having each of those stages be consistent, we really haven't solved that problem. So an analogy to that problem is the problem of looking, if you look at a bunch of soap bubbles and the soap bubbles are gradually changing their, the, the, the edges of the soap bubbles form something like a graph and you know soap bubbles will gradually, eventually a soap bubble will pop and then the rest of the graph that represents the, the boundaries between soap bubbles will, will move around, will adapt to deal with the fact that the graph structure has changed. We would like to have something a bit similar to that in representing kind of the dynamics of, uh, of one of these hypergraphs, but we haven't solved the problem of how to do it. And it would be wonderful if, if someone could, could help with that. And it would be really good, we're, we're um, uh, actually our, our graph theory team at, at Wolfram Research was um, uh, said, yeah, they'll try and come up with some virtual reality based system for doing this graph layout thing. But um, I think they're, they're busy doing other things. And uh, we, we'd love to get, um, uh, we'd love it if, if some other people were interested in, in helping with that. And um, we're happy to provide the code that we have so far for, um, for doing that. But the, the end result will be to have something where you can really kind of live with your graph, so to speak, and be able to manipulate them. I mean, we'd like something where you can, I think, I think one's fingers are probably going to be a really good way to have an interface to, um, I, I think it's actually going to work better than, for example, the typical, you know, game controller type things. I don't think that's, I think one's going to have to pick up the graph and pluck it and put it somewhere. I think that's going to be a little bit awkward when one has a game controller and one has to hold some button down to, to, to pick the thing. So it'll be good to have something which has some uh, more like a, a thing that can actually sense finger locations and so on. Okay, let's see. Um, Okay, question from Nil on Hacker News. Model seems very flexible to the point where I'm unsure whether it's surprising to be able to recover general relativity and other properties. Um, but uh, saying is that bit out of his depth, but given uh, the, the depth, but, but um, given that string theory seems to face a similar problem of model selection, have you looked at equivalences between these and does that make sense in your eyes? So, so the whole string landscape thing is really not an issue that we have. I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a strange feature of string theory and, and its, its problems. The, the appearance of general relativity is, in my opinion, really quite non-trivial. It might not have worked that way. I mean, it, it really doesn't, it is the fact that it turns out that general relativity is generic to a wide class of our models 
is, I think, a statement that we're really kind of on the right track in the structure of these models. I mean, one could easily, for example, let's imagine, let's take as a kind of a null hypothesis or something. Let's say we're going to make a cellular automaton reproduce general relativity. It's going to be really hard. It's basically just not going to work. It's not going to work to reproduce special relativity. It's not going to work to reproduce general relativity. So that's a case where if you want to say, is there content here? The answer is, well, it certainly might not have worked. I think there's real content in saying that it worked. Um, now, question about the string landscape. Do you want to, Jonathan, do you have any comments about the string landscape? Or uh, ab about the landscape in particular, not really. Um, about connections to string theory, which I think was the second part. I think we both have things to say about. I mean, do you want to, do you want to take the... Well, yeah, right. I mean, look, the snake states. Okay. So, so again, we, we, hopefully we will do some live streams with some, uh, um, you know, uh, sort of people who are in the true string theory business who do string theory for a living. Um, we, we actually had a discussion uh, before we launched this project with a, with a group of string theorists. Um, the, um, uh, I think, I strongly suspect that string theory and its mathematical structure represents some limit of some corner of our space of models. Um, but I think actually it's probably not our standard hypergraph models. I think bizarrely, it's probably a limit of string substitution systems, which are kind of a, you can reproduce string substitution systems from hypergraphs, but they're not particularly natural from there. Um, but it's something which is, is, is kind of easy to look at where you're just dealing with strings of symbols. And the question is, which I have long wondered about actually, is what is the continuum limit of string substitution systems? And the bizarre pun-like possibility is that it might be string theory or string field theory. Um, but that really has to be investigated. And I think it's, a, it's, it's just a, it's a really interesting thing to look at. Independent, you know, string substitution systems have a continuum limit. We don't know what it is. And, um, you know, it might be string theory, it might be something different, but just investigating the continuum limit of string substitution systems is immediately an interesting mathematical problem. Did you have something else you wanted to add? Uh, yeah, well, I, let, let, me, let me give, to make, to make it seem like it's not just based on a pun, <laughs> to make it clear there is actual substance here. Uh, let, me, let me give a kind of very sort of uh, conjectural outline of how, how that might work. So, um, we have, okay, if you consider a multi-way system, whether it's a multi-way system for hypergraphs or a multi-way system for, for strings, it kind of doesn't matter. Um, you have all these states and they're, and they're branch-like separated, but some of them are kind of purely branch-like separated in the sense that the updating events actually overlapped with each other and produced ambiguities. And some of them are actually just space-like separated, right? They, they, were, they were completely spatially independent events that just happened to lead to different outcomes. And so all, if you have causal invariance, or if you have, sorry, if you have, uh, Basically, if, if everything is in causal contact, then all the space-like separated updating events will eventually reconverge. And that the and so the, the essence is the essence of the multi-way branching of these branch-like of these purely branch-like uh, separated updating events. Okay. So one thing we realized was, in addition to having this this full multi-way system, we could invent this thing called a generational multi-way system, where basically at every step we apply a maximally consistent set of space-like separated updating events. So that the only branches we see are the pure branch-like separations. And so, that, so then this gives, this gives us states of this generational multi-way system, which we describe as being snake states. And the reason we call, we call them that, in, or at least informally call them that in some of our material, is because if you, you, can, you can track them in the normal multi-way system, because all you have to do is track the subset of states that were produced by purely space-like separated events. And that, for a string substitution system, that will be a one-dimensional a, a, a one extended structure in the multi-way system. Then those snake states that yield these generational multi-way states, they have, you know, they, they can merge, they can split, they, they have, they appear to have kind of um, a, a sort of propagator type behavior. And at least in toy examples, it seems entirely plausible that actually that, that those, are, those are acting like world, the, the, the um, sort of the, the history of those snake states act like world sheets in string field theory, and that those joining and merging operations of the generational multi-way system are actually the, 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 jo the joining and merging, the, um, yeah, sorry, the, the, the merging and splitting uh, 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 vertices for the, for the string field theory propagator. I just wanted, I was just gonna find a snake here. Yes, yeah, this is gonna make it much less, this is gonna make what I said much less obscure. <laughs> right, so th there's an example of a, of a, of a snake. Um, this is in the Branchial graph, and that is the that is a snake state in the Branchial graph. Um, 
and uh, I think I think Jonathan, I don't know whether you ever did this, whether you whether you ended ended up with a section of a paper called "Snakes on a Plane." Um, <laughs> I was very tempted, but I think you advised me not to. <laughs> Fair enough. The, um, but yeah, so the, the, the notion would be that's the world sheet, basically. That's the evolution of the world sheet. It corresponds to the evolution of the snake state through, um, through, uh, through time in the successive stages of the branch hill graph. Um, so that's the idea there. Okay, let's see. Next question was from uh, uh, Ninja of LU. Where does distance come into this? I don't think I caught anything about it in your article, only rough length scales, where do those come from? Okay, well, let's, let's talk about that. Um, all right, what is, gosh, what, how should we describe what is distance? Um, let's, uh, um, I think I might have some nice pictures here. Um, I don't yet know my, my um, here we go. All right, so, so distance, the, the simplest measure of distance in space on the spatial hypergraph is the graph distance between points. So that means if you're going from, for example, this point to this point, you're asking what is the shortest path through the graph to get from one point to the other. That's, that's the notion of distance. That is the simplest notion of distance that we have in these hypergraphs. Um, and that's a, a well-defined notion of distance. It satisfies all the, all the sort of standard axioms that a distance should satisfy. Now, is that the true physical distance between those points? Really, when we want to measure distance in the real world, so to speak, we'll do things like send a light signal from one place to another. So it isn't really the case that it's just a question of what path on the graph exists. It's a question of how does a photon get from here to there? Well, in our model, a photon is just part of the graph. So certainly uh, a part of the story of how a photon gets from here to there is it's propagating through the graph. It's, it's making use of edges in the graph. Um, but that's not the whole story of how you get from here to there. And so it's, it's slightly more complicated to say, what is the, um, uh, what is the, what's the, What's the distance as measured by a photon as opposed to what's the abstract distance in space? This is talking here about the abstract distance in space. We can also talk about the distance measured by photons, but it will be related to the distance measured in space. So I think that's, that's kind of the, um, uh, and, and in terms of what is that actual distance? Well, um, in, uh, the, what, what we're looking at in the end is, is um, uh, we're looking at causal graphs that tell one for after one unit of elementary time, one will be uh, sort of connecting two points in space. Um, and the, the, the sort of conversion factor of one unit of elementary time, how far is that in physical space? Well, it's about speed of light times that elementary time. That's sort of the way of, of setting the dimensions, setting the units for, for that distance. Let's see. Um, okay, so a question from um, uh, Javier here, um, Javier Lopez. Um, we'd like to know what are the nodes of the hypergraphs exactly? Are they nodes of space? Basically, yes. I mean, they're abstract elements that are what make up space. I mean, I think that's the best way to say it. And they're not only what make up space, they're what make up everything in the universe. They are, everything in the universe is made of the, the sort of set of relations between these, these nodes in the hypergraph. So that means when we have a particle, for example, it must arise because of sort of the, 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 the pattern of connections associated with, uh, between these particular nodes in the hypergraph. Um, is it correct that the model you're proposing must be from Bernard Gress on Facebook? Is it correct that the model you're proposing must be multi-way? Uh, yes, yes, it is. It is um, for any non-trivial uh, underlying rewrite rule, it will be the case that there are ambiguities about how that rule can be applied. And the result of that is that uh, the way we're representing that is through this multi-way system. And that has the, 
the feature that, well, as I say, any non-trivial rule will have that property, that it has this ambiguity, and we're saying that that means that you have to follow all the possibilities, which leads to a multi-way system, and what's really nice about that is it inevitably leads you to quantum mechanics, which I think is, uh, and it sort of explains, you know, why is there quantum mechanics? Why isn't the world made of, of, of what, why, why is it not the case that classical mechanics can govern our universe? Well, the answer is, in this model, it's just inevitable that you couldn't make a universe that was purely governed by classical things that had non-trivial, that, that would work. Actually, interesting question, which I'm now wondering about. Could we imagine a, um, a model like this? I don't think we could. I think we could not imagine a model with sort of computational irreducibility, causal invariance, all these kinds of things uh, that has the property that it would be a purely classical model. Jonathan, any thoughts about that? I don't think it's possible. I think we'll probably prove that that's not possible. In other words, we could prove that the multi-way nature of, um, uh, of progression through time is necessary in order to achieve a non-trivial universe. That there is only only trivial universes could satisfy purely classical mechanics. Do you believe that, Jonathan? I think know? that's probably true. Yes, um, I need to think about exactly how you'd prove that. But the so w one possible way you could is um, we know that the so the, the word problem in computational group theory is is formally undecidable, and effectively the reason it's formally undecidable is because if you try and decide the word problem. Uh, you, you have to tree out this whole multi-way system of possible kind of uh, group derivations for, for your finitely presented monoid. And the, and, and the fact that, if, that you have that multi-way evolution and, and that in particular sort of multi-way branches can extend infinitely is the reason why it's undecidable. So I think the converse of that would say, yeah, if you right. didn't have a multi-way evolution, then the word problem would be decidable, which we know that it's not. So I think, yeah. Well, I no, think no, right. I, I would put it differently. I think the point is that that what you're saying is as soon as there isn't multiple evolution, the word problem is decidable. And, and therefore I think you that have means you can't have computational reducibility and you can't have a universality. So right, I think you right, then exactly. prove that your universe can't uh, have any richness to it. So um, that, that's, uh, okay, interesting, interesting result. This is, this is um, kind of what we, um, it's sort of the point of, of having an open science project, so to speak, is that people will raise these kinds of questions which let us get to, to interesting results. Thanks. Um, somebody noting very cool derivation of general relativity. Yes, thank you. We think so. Um, uh, okay. Are you able to show how to derive Maxwell's equations from your model, from James? Uh, good question. Okay, so the sort of the closest, so to derive Maxwell's equations, we need a notion of electric charge. Um, and we don't yet have a notion of electric charge. Um, we think that electric charge will be associated with essentially, uh, uh, so electric charge probably, okay, here's an interesting question that we um, um, don't, um, uh, um, the, um, that we don't have, um, uh, actually this is, a, this is a good question. We don't know if there is a bulk notion of charge. I have to say, when we came into this project, I didn't think we were going to be able to define energy in a kind of bulk way that wasn't dependent on looking at the properties of individual particles, okay? And to my surprise, we managed to figure out that energy is a flux of causal edges through space-like hypersurfaces. So now the, the exercise is, is there a bulk definition of charge? Um, and because what we've been thinking is that charge is associated, you know what, I bet there is. Okay, so, so um, I mean, charge is normally uh, associated with particles like electrons have charge minus one and things like that. Charge, unlike, um, uh, th there's, a, there's an immediate quantization of charge that we know exists for physical particles. Charges have, particles all have multiples of the one third electron charge charge that quarks have, or at least that's how it appears right now. So the question of, of um, so actually that's a really good question, whether there's a bulk way to understand charge in our models. And I, I'm kind of, kind of guess that it has some topological character that is like, um, that has some discreteness for some topological reason, like it's, it's some Pontryagin index or something, or some, something like this, which has discreteness um, because, okay, so, the answer is we don't really know the answer, but the, what I had been thinking 
before being stimulated in a slightly different direction here, is that what we would have to do is to reproduce local gauge invariants. So one thing to say, Maxwell's equations were the original place where the idea of local gauge invariants arose, where the idea of being able to say, um, it's kind of like uh, you can set the zero of voltage anywhere you want. You don't have to say, what, what is zero volts? Well, you know, what is the ground for a circuit? You know, you can kind of set that arbitrarily and you can set it differently in different parts of space. And that, that freedom to set it differently in different parts of space is local gauge invariance. And one of the features of local gauge invariance is it implies the existence of photons. Um, and it's not too hard to give an argument for that. Um, but uh, the, I mean, okay, I'll give the argument just for people, many people may know this argument. Imagine you have an electron and the electron is producing an electric field. The electric field kind of looks like, you know, looks like a hedgehog streaming out from the electron. And okay, that's absolutely fine. Now let's say you move the electron. Okay, so far away from the electron, the electric field has to change. That hedgehog has to be displaced. The question is, how does that displacement, how does the fact that you move the electron, how does the information that you move the electron propagate out to the sort of outer edges of the hedgehog, so to speak? Um, and the answer is, it propagates out through having, there's a, there, there has to be some sort of the analog of a massless particle, a photon that is sort of propagating that change out uh, to the, to the uh, sort of distant places where the electric field is, is showing up. So anyway, the, the, um, uh, the sort of the derivation of Maxwell's equations would normally come through showing a U1 local, local gauge invariance. We have ideas about how to establish that local gauge invariance, um, but uh, I am now thinking that there is a bulk way to understand charge, and I bet it has to do with See, the thing is that normal topology doesn't really apply to our hypergraphs. We need to generalize normal notions of topology. Okay, Jonathan, I'm going to throw this one at you. Do you have any ideas about, about sort of what the, what some analog of something like a Pontryagin index or one of these or Betty numbers or something like that would be for these hypergraphs that... Um, uh, uh, not, not right now. I, I need to think about it. I mean, it's, it's actually... It's a really interesting idea. It's it's something. It's it's quite similar to something we discussed, I think, a couple of months ago about a possible way of thinking about charge, which was that um, you know, so within within the models as we've been thinking about them, uh, the energy momentum tensor, as Stephen mentioned, is basically this this flux of individual causal edges, each of which corresponds effectively to the updating of a single hyper edge in, in the hypergraph. But you can also think about fluxes of kind of configurations of hyper edges, not just single hyper edge configurations, but kind of, you know, configurations of three hyper edges, and you could flux those and, and things like that. And, and, and kind of, you can imagine having more non-trivial topological structures and, and, and sort of classifying fluxes of topological obstructions and things like this. And um, one you know of what, the things- I have an idea. We, we should look at the cycle structure of the cause of, of these graphs, because I think that's a, that's a place where one can imagine, see, see what you're suggesting there, is when we look at fluxes of individual, first point, when you're looking at fluxes of individual causal edges, that's basically a vector field type story. And, and there's a question of, as you're mentioning, there's a question of when you're looking at multiple hyper edges um, uh, attached to a single point, you're looking at essentially the flux of higher order tensors. So one first question is, what is the analog? So just as if energy is a flux of causal edges through space-like hypersurfaces, what is the flux of pairs of correlated causal edges through a hypersurface. And um, so what's the higher order analog? So I think what that, that would be, the first level of, of thing is a higher order analog of T mu nu, a higher order analog of the energy momentum tensor. So that's the question, what would that be? That's gonna be higher order derivatives applied to the distribution of, of energy momentum, so to speak. So first question, so this is a general relativity question. What is the what is the higher order version? So, I mean, given that you have a star, for example, and the star has some distribution of, of, uh, of, of, of density and so on in it, there clearly is a higher order generalization of pure T mu nu for that. What is it? I mean, I guess, I guess at some level it's derivatives of T mu nu, but what's not obvious to me is that T mu nu um, on its own, so, so the, the, the claim would be Yes, here's the claim. The claim, T mu nu probably is the way it is because a bulk material is characterized by pressure and energy density. But that is an approximation. So if we think about a gas, for example, the, the saying that a gas is characterized by its pressure and its, um, 
uh, yeah, that, 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 the, the way to think about that is this. The, um, so to say that a gas is characterized by its pressure and its energy density is to look at the one particle distribution function. If you're looking at the multi-particle distribution function, you have more stuff. And so that's gonna be what the analog is. The analog is if instead of T mu nu, you're looking at the correlated, T mu nu is a, is a way, yes, okay, I get it. So T mu nu is, is what you get from, um, from looking at a material and saying, I'm gonna scale up the material and I'm gonna look only at the one particle distribution function. If you were to look at the two particle distribution function, which you could do in a gas and in the virial expansion, for example, you would get things like that. Um, then that is, um, uh, but, that, but to say that you're looking at the two particle distribution function is to admit that your material is not a truly bulk continuum material. It's to admit that it's made of molecules and you've actually got some, some underlying uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, correlation between those molecules. So I'm, I'm kind of gonna guess that what's gonna happen is, oh, that's interesting. It's, it's some, that it's, it's going to have, uh, when you look at this higher order piece, it's going to be something that actually cares about things like, uh, you know, branch hill space and so on, as well as caring about physical space. But I think that's a, it's an interesting idea to think about what's the generalization of T mu nu in a case. So I would suspect in kinetic theory in relativistic kinetic theory, that people have tried to generalize. Yeah, it's in fact, in fact, I worked on this 40 years ago. Okay, the, it's, it's because I wanted to know what the, what the generalization of, so, so standard, the standard gas laws, PV equals NRT or whatever. The question is, what is that like for a relativistic gas? And then what is that like for relativistic non-ideal gas? What does it even mean to have a relativistic non-ideal gas? And the answer in that case, when you thought about it in terms of particles, was that the, um, uh, the, it, it's directly related, the corrections to the gas law are directly related to uh, phase shifts which come out in the S matrix and the scattering matrix. So in other words, when, when a gas is non-ideal, what it means is that the, the particles of the gas aren't just elastically bouncing off each other. They're kind of delaying before they, before they go on. So I, I think there's, okay, so I'm, I'm predicting that there's a, there's a direct sort of connection between the sort of virial expansion for uh, the, the uh, non-ideal gases, sort of higher order corrections, multiple, okay. This is an interesting thing to investigate. All right, sorry, we're, we're, we're generating homework for ourselves or for, or for other people here. Um, but but um, so, I mean, I think the bottom line is, I'm gonna guess that charge is, we should really look at this. I, I think there are gonna be some things about cycles on the graph or some other graph theoretic thing independent that doesn't require the, the um, that some other sort of uh, graph theoretic characterization which is going to have, and we've already got a clue because we know about quant the quantization of charge. And that's presumably a clue which tells us that, for example, it, I mean, the, the, you know, there'll be some things which, for example, the question of whether a cycle closes may be an answer, maybe something which is a sort of a, or some question about whether you, if you have multiple cycles, whether they can be not, yeah, there's, there's probably a, a, an algebra of cycles that will be analogous to stuff I don't understand very well in, in holonomy and things like this and in, in, um, in, in, of curves in, in, um, in mathematics. Any comments? Uh, I, I just wanted to make one quick comment about how this, this sort of general idea of you know, considering larger scale sort of uh, structures of, of causal edges and, and, their, and their fluxes uh, through the causal graph, how that sort of um, nestles with the, the ideas we currently have about local gauge invariants. So one of the really nice features of, as, as Stephen mentioned, you know, Max Maxwell's equations, this whole idea of, uh, you know, how, how of the equations of motion for, for, char for electric charge, this was the first real hint in the history of physics of this concept of local gauge invariance. Our current ideas about local gauge invariance are that, okay, when you, when you have one of these hypergraphs, as, as I mentioned earlier, um, you can think about when you're evolving just the pure Wolfram model case, not the multi-way case, what you care about are the kind of maximally consistent sets of space-like separated updating events. The crucial point is because of the hypergraph structure, where you apply the first updating event places constraints on where you can put the other updating events. You've got like a kind of jigsaw puzzle, tessellation problem that you have to solve at that point. So it's like your initial choice of where to apply the update, which hyper edges to include in your update is like a, a, a choice of a local coordinate frame. And in fact, we can make a sort of precise mathematical correspondence here in terms of uh, thinking about uh, gauges in terms of um, connections on, uh, gauge choices in terms of connections on fiber bundles. So you can think about the hypergraph as a, as a fiber bundle 
and and so each each individual node a hypernode corresponding to a fiber with the with the different kind of edge orientations corresponding to, to local gauge choices but then if you have if you make a more complicated gauge choice that involves more than one hyper edge that's then going to be constrained and will in turn constrain how causal how pairwise sort of um, causal edges can get fluxed through the causal graph and i think that's potentially how we're going to be able to derive something like Maxwell's equations. But that's, there's a lot still to be figured out there. Right. But I think there's a good idea. We had not really thought about charge as a bulk quantity, and we need to think about that. And I think there's, I think there's something interesting there. Thank you. There. OK. Let's see. A uh, question from Naman Agawal. Fundamentally, is your model like loop quantum gravity? Um, let's see. Well, Jonathan, you understand loop quantum gravity. Why don't you, why don't you talk about that? Okay, uh, sure. So, so the, the sh there's a uh, I can give a longer answer to this if people really care, but let me first give the let me give the short answer, which is um, there's a sense in which it's like loop quantum gravity, and there's a sense in which what we're doing is is fundamentally different. So the, the similarity with LQG is in LQG people care. You know, one of the really nice features of LQG is that it it has a combinatorial representation of space and space time, which is of course very similar to what we're doing. So in in LQG, what you have is a structure called a spin network. Which is a way of representing the quantum. If you have a, a if you have a space time, you divide it up into these three dimensional space like hypersurfaces, and you want to define the gravitational field on each of those hypersurfaces. There's this combinatorial structure that represents the quantum state of that gravitational field and its kind of entanglement state, and that's called a spin network. And these kind of the fundamental objects of LQG. And then when you consider the whole of space time, that combinatorial structure gets replaced with this higher dimensional object, a topological two complex, as it's called, that represents the quantum state of the gravitational fields across the whole space time. And that's, uh, that's this thing called a spin foam. And so in a sense, a spin foam is what you get when you evolve a spin network through time. And this is actually, you know, in the, from the point of view of doing physics in terms of thinking about physics in terms of combinatorial structures, this is very similar to our notion of, you know, start with a space-like hypergraph and then kind of evolve it in time and you get this, this causal graph structure. But at a mathematics, so on the surface, they, they, they have various features of the formalism uh, in common. And actually, our hope is that uh, some of what we a some of what the LQG people have done will be useful in what we've been doing, and hopefully vice versa. Some of our insights, we, we hope, will also stimulate some research in LQG. Um, the, the one key point where what we're doing is fundamentally different is in the case of a spin network, the edges actually mean something, right? In the sense that each edge represents an irreducible representation of a compact Lie group. Um, where, and, that, and that compact Lie group is kind of, is, is already defined and the vertices then correspond to the, to the intertwiners of the adjacencies in that, in, uh, in the, uh, sorry, of the, of the adjacent representations of that compact Lie group. So the point is with our models, we, have, we, do, we don't define a compact Lie group a priori. Right, all of the kind of algebraic and symmetric uh, uh, features of our of our models emerge purely as a result of the discrete underlying hypergraph dynamics. So, we're, in, at some level, what we're doing can be considered a significantly less, uh, a significantly more structureless version of what people were already studying in LQG. That, that's my short answer. Isn't isn't it the case that in in that there's a background space time effectively? I mean, there's a you know these these spin networks are embedded in three plus one dimensional space. Yes, right. So th this is. Um, Okay, that, that's a that's a good point. That's another good. Uh, that's another uh, sort of crucial place where where what we're doing diverges with with LQG, and also where it diverges with other kind of combinatorial representation ideas, like in like in causal dynamical triangulation and other kinds of things. All of these models, as, as Stephen said, basically assume you have a background continuous space time, and then you do some, you, you, and then you decompose it. You, usually, you do this topological operation called a simplicial decomposition. You decompose it into what's called a simplicial complex, where you're just kind of tessellating the space with a bunch of these simple topological objects called simplices. And then that gives you a topological structure, this combinatorial structure, which then is supposed to represent the quantum state of the gravitational field or something like that. Um, we're kind of doing the, the opposite thing, right? We're starting with the combinatorial representation, and we're, we're, we're kind of um, we're evolving it to a, to a point where uh, the, the continuum background space time actually emerges as a consequence of the combinatorial structure as opposed to the other way around. That's, that's a good point. That's another key. Right. Actually, we, if you didn't have that in your Q&A answer about LQG, you should probably put that in there. Yeah, I'll make it out now. The, 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 um, uh, no, I, I mean, the, sort of, to sort of summarize that difference, I mean, you know, in, in LQG, one starting from the assumption of continuous space time and then, uh, and then saying, let's, let's put, you know, let's discretize that existing set of you know dimensions of space and time whereas we're we're saying just start everything from this hypergraph you you haven't committed to three plus one dimensional space time okay how do you get continuous um 
age bronze on Twitch. How do you get continuous geometry when looking at most of your example models, you have a grid-like structure which only has a finite number of dimensions? Okay, similar to cellular automata where you got Manhattan distance geometry, uh, you always get finite number of dimensions. Okay, so the, the answer to that is, it is the case that some very simple examples have grid-like structure. Um, the more generic case is that there's great randomness in the sort of in the structure that statistically the thing is let's say two-dimensional, but the actual detailed structure is not in any way a grid. You're absolutely right that if you had a pure grid, you would have Manhattan distances and not standard Euclidean distances. But the generic case is that there's microscopic randomness effectively that leads you to have something that's much more like a random mesh uh, on which you have an approximation to Euclidean distances. Um, okay, a question from uh, uh, Javier Lopez. You've been able to derive other equations like Maxwell's equations um, consistent with physical laws. We talked about Maxwell's equations there. I don't know, what, what, what else is there in physics? Um, let's see, there's, I mean, you know, the standard model has, okay, let's, let's go through the inventory of what's in the standard model. It has a certain set of particles. It has a certain set of local gauge invariances. Um, it has, uh, uh, it has some, uh, well, it has spontaneous symmetry breaking. It has the Higgs field and the coupling to the Higgs field. Um, and we haven't thought much about the Higgs field and spontaneous symmetry breaking yet. Um, the, the Higgs field is kind of the modern ether, so to speak in the sense that the, the way that, you know, in, standard, um, in the standard model, the way that particles get mass is through there being a non-zero vacuum expectation value of this Higgs field. Um, and uh, uh, that, you know, in, in our setup, where we're building space as part of our model, this idea of a vacuum expectation value has a slightly different character and needs to be thought about. Um, so another thing about the standard model that it's perhaps interesting to look at is the uh, off-diagonal elements of mass matrices and things like uh, CP violation we mentioned yesterday, which has to do with complex terms that, which can be thought of in terms of complex terms and mass matrices, things like that. Um, those are things that uh, as we start figuring out more about particles, uh, I suspect we will see examples where there are off-diagonal terms and mass matrices and things. This also happens with neutrinos. Um, okay. Uh, Shumash on YouTube. Can you, this explain the second order of thermodynamics? It is just great that people are asking about the second order of thermodynamics. I thought nobody had thought about the second order of thermodynamics anymore because the second order of thermodynamics was one of the first sort of foundational physics things that I got interested in when I was 12 years old. And I've been interested in the second order of thermodynamics ever since then. And I think finally in the 1990s, I kind of figured out why the second law is true. And the fundamental answer is the second law is all about taking, okay, let, let's be a little bit formal about the second law. The, the issue is that we believe that the microscopic dynamics of physics are reversible in the sense that they're not, they're not um, it doesn't happen to be exactly the same operator for forwards in time as backwards in time, but it is nevertheless the case that states are mapped one-to-one -one from the, the set of states that you have uh, as you go forward in time is a one-to-one -one mapping uh, the, as, as you go forwards in time. So you can always reverse the set of states. Okay, so given that every state has a unique successor, every state has a unique predecessor, how can it be the case then that we get what we observe in the second law, which is that you start from these kind of simple looking states and you end up with these states that's, that seem random or put in a more formal way, seem typical of the ensemble of all possible states. Okay, and the way this is very confusing, this is what, you know, from 1870 when Boltzmann did his H theorem and so on, this was the reversibility objection. This was always the confusion of how could you show that entropy increases um, when there is this microscopic reversibility. And what, what happened in Boltzmann's proof was that he was effectively assuming molecular chaos. He was assuming that molecules would be uncorrelated before they collide, but then inevitably they become correlated after they collide. And that's where the sort of the, the asymmetry in the proof comes from. But so then people like Gibbs uh, tried to work out sort of a more mathematical formalization of um, the way that the second law works. And what Gibbs introduced was this idea of coarse graining. The idea that um, you even that, that um, when, when you look at all these particles and they're all bouncing around 
that the only thing you end up measuring is the approximate coarse grain position of all the molecules. You don't get to say this was the particular. Con okay, so th thing to say: if you knew the, if I knew the precise configuration of all the molecules of air in this room, and the room was perfectly closed and so on, then in principle I could sort of run the movie in reverse and I could work out where the molecules were yesterday. And for example, in particular, if all the molecules had been in one clump in the middle of the room and the rest of the room was a vacuum and everything had expanded out, I would be able to reverse the movie and find out that the molecules came from that small clump in the middle of the room. And that would be kind of a, a um, uh, in, in, so uh, why can't you do that? So Gibbs had this approach of saying, well, because you can only make coarse grain measurements. You can't actually know the precise positions of all the molecules. You can only know coarse grain versions of that. Okay, so I sort of figured out a more precise version of that statement that I think is really the, the thing that is the sort of provable version of the second law of thermodynamics. And the more precise statement is that, uh, oh, by the way, when you talk about coarse graining, people got kind of confused because like how complicated can, can the coarse graining be? Is it really just lumps in phase space? Is it, what is it? Well, okay, so my claim is the correct way to think about coarse graining is it has to be a computationally feasible thing to do. So you can make all kinds of elaborate measurements on these molecules, but it has to be a limited amount of computation that you're doing in trying to invert the dynamics and so on. And so then the, the basic point is that computational irreducibility um, implies that even when you start from a simple to describe initial condition, it is inevitable that you effectively encrypt that initial condition to the point where a, an observer with bounded computational ability can't decode it and work, it, work out where it came from. So put another way, when we see heat, which is kind of the, the, the sort of the high entropy, the disordered version of, of energy, when we see heat, if we had a sufficiently sophisticated computational system, we could invert the motions of all those molecules and we could say, oh, that piece of heat came from this very simple initial condition. But in practice, we can't do that. So the, the presence of sort of heat is a consequence of, of, of something that we consider to be completely disordered energy is a consequence of the fact that our uh, measurement process is only of uh, sort of isn't computationally sophisticated enough to invert the the dynamics that led to the disorder that we see there. Uh, there's a there's a fine description I think of this in a section of my new kind of science book, the beginning of chapter nine. The end of chapter nine is about the kind of fundamental physics that we're talking about here. The beginning of chapter nine is about second law of thermodynamics, and you guys are really encouraging me because I put those together in the same chapter because I thought they were conceptually related, and I really had thought people had completely forgotten that conceptual relation. By the way, this argument for the second law is critical in our theory of fundamental physics because we need this kind of microscopic randomness to be able to explain how continuum behavior occurs and to be able to do things like explain why one isn't getting Manhattan distance on, on, on you know, in, in these, um, in, uh, and having pure sort of grid-like structures in space-time. Okay. Oh boy, we have a lot of questions here. All right, let's 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 see if we can zip through these. Um, okay, there's a Pacta Sunt Savanda. That probably is something in Latin, which I can't translate immediately, but um, uh, we'd like a general discussion of different digital physics approaches and how these new theories approach things differently and handle the usual criticisms about discrete versus continuous, which have already been discussed. So. I think a lot of sort of what one means by digital physics has really re re revolved around cellular automata. I've been a huge enthusiast of cellular automata. A lot of stuff I figured out has been a consequence of looking at cellular automata. I had always felt that cellular automata were a singularly bad model of fundamental physics. I mean, ironically enough, when I first started working on cellular automata, I originally invented my version of cellular automata before I knew that people had studied them in different forms before as a, as a result of trying to idealize two phenomena. One was self-gravitating gases and the other was neural networks. This was around 1980 or so. And ironically enough, cellular automata are good models for many things, but they are uniquely bad models of both self-gravitating gases, which have long-range forces in them, and neural networks, which have sort of long-range connections in them. 
But I also think that cellular automata are not good models for, uh, for fundamental physics. I think that they, their notion of this sort of rigid notion of space and time is just not a good fit with, uh, uh, with what we kind of, with sort of having the flexibility to have sort of emergent space and time, which is what we've discovered is what leads to things like general relativity, special relativity, quantum mechanics, and so on. Now, having said that, cellular automata are a fantastic source of intuition. And you know that's where the intuition that led me to start studying the kinds of models we're talking about here all came from cellular automata. It's just I wasn't looking specifically at cellular automata um, in, uh, in trying to understand what might be underneath space and time. And I think um, the questions like, how do you get rotational invariance in a cellular automaton? Uh, you can get some. I've got examples of that in New Kind of Science. But it's kind of a mess, and it's very unnatural. Whereas in these models where there's sort of a, uh, a just connectivity data, where you're building your own space rather than having space imposed upon you, those things are much more natural. And... Uh, I'm actually a little concerned. I haven't heard from my friend, Ed Fredkin, who's been a big, uh, big proponent of digital physics. I sent him this stuff. I, I, I am I'm concerned I didn't hear from him yet, but I'll, maybe it's in my email right now. Um, okay. Does this theory disallow the exponential speed ups proposed by Shaw's algorithm? Interesting question. Interesting question. Uh, so, uh, well, I'll, I'll take one crack at this. That, to make the statement that causal invariance. So Jonathan already mentioned this point about Turing machines, non-deterministic Turing machines and quantum Turing machines. And this sort of, the, the, the picture that Shaw's algorithm for factoring on a quantum computer, the sort of picture is, oh, it trees out all the possibilities in parallel and then just tells you the answer. The real story, I think, well, two points, first of all, Back in, what was it, 1981, two, something around that time, I, I worked on quantum computers long before anybody had heard of quantum computers. Actually, uh, Dick Feynman and I tried to work together on studying quantum computers. We had somewhat incompatible approaches to, uh, to science. His was much more, let's go calculate with a piece of paper. Mine was much more, go, go run a computer simulation. I don't think either of us necessarily believed what each other was getting, but it, setting that aside, the thing that we both, thought was a big issue was this question of when you've done the computation, how do you do the measurement? And would you end up in a situation where you were so, uh, you know, you had so much sort of detail to untangle in the measurement that you wouldn't actually gain anything in the parallelization in, quant in, the, in the quantum mechanics. So now in terms of these models where we actually have this picture of the multi-way system as the whole story, and then we're sort of having to read out pieces of the multi-way system this question of what exactly is involved in measurement, I think, comes more to the fore. And I think this question of what we can do in the, in the, in the light of causal invariance, um, how much treeing out can we really do, is interesting. And I think Jonathan has thought more about this, so maybe he can make some comments about this. Uh, sure. I mean, yeah, uh, Stephen's Stephen's point or, uh, already covers sort of the, the majority of what I was what I was going to say. Um, so, so yeah. I mean, there's this problem of um, there's basically a trade-off here between um, the more treeing out you get in the multi-way evolution, the more complicated your procedure has to be in order to be able to collapse that multi-way evolution back down to a single evolution thread so that you can get effectively a classical answer out, which is what you have to be able to do if you, if you want to be able to uh, you know, factor an integer or something. Because um, you know, in, in ordinary quantum computers, you set this up so that the, the eigenstates that give you the wrong factorization have amplitudes that exactly cancel, so that in the end, the eigenstate that gave you the correct uh, factorization is the only one you see. We have the same problem, so we have to we have to do this this completion procedure on the on the multi-way evolution graph that collapses all these branches down to give you a single causal invariant result. And the more exponential treeing out there is, the more complex that the, the more sort of um, the more computationally irreducible, I should say, the uh, that, that completion procedure is going to be. And so eventually, there's a kind of point where the 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 benefit th these curves basically cross over. There's a point where the benefit of the exponential treeing out intersects with the the sort of the, the loss that you're getting from this exponentially uh, the, this um, completion procedure that's sort of of exponentially increasing computational complexity. And this puts bounds. We don't know it 
We don't know definitively that it rules out the potentially exponential speedups of Shor's algorithm, but it certainly puts bounds on the speedups of things like Shor's algorithms. Uh, and this is related to the thing I was mentioning earlier about the bounds of how much uh, the complexity classes of P versus BQP can be related. Uh, that's something we still have to compute in detail. But this is, uh, as far as I know, um, you know from, from having looked at the sort of quantum computing literature on this kind of thing, um, this is the first kind of definitive bound that, that's kind of based on a, a well-defined interpretation of quantum mechanics that, that puts well-defined bounds on, uh, on sort of the potential speed up of things like Shor's algorithm. I think the main point here is that, you know, gosh, I've been sort of waiting for this for 40 years, is, is that making the measurement process more realistic is what you need to do to know exactly what you can really get out from a quantum computer. And I've been, I've been sort of saying this vaguely for 40 years, but I think we now have an actual way to do this. And I think this is something we need to do or somebody else needs to do it's some, somebody um, uh, to actually work out, um, you know, what is the cost of measurement, so to speak, which I don't think we really have understood very well before, but now we have a, a pretty concrete way of, of assessing the cost of measurement. Um, and so that should be done. Okay. Let's see. Um, uh, is it possible to render a perspective projection from within the graph by tracing geodesics over the graph? For example, to uh, a sphere with a radius centered on the same node. So that's an interesting idea. So that's, a, that's an idea for visualization of these graphs. That is an interesting idea. So, I mean, in other words, to look the geodesic eyes view of the graph. We haven't done that. I mean, it's a good idea. We could try it. I mean, it's, or you can try it. Um, I mean, I think that that, um, when we start thinking about, you know, what does, the, what, does the, what does the electron see when it's propagating through space? That's kind of what we're going to have to look at. Um, and, and particularly when we're looking at multiple steps in the evolution of the graph, uh, combined with the motion of the electron and so on, that will be an interesting thing to do. Good idea, not thought of that. Okay, Gabriel uh, Leuenberger, why are you not using pure lambda calculus, which is the simplest model and is confluent? Um, okay. Uh, well, let's see, I did discuss that actually a little bit in, in um, section seven of my technical introduction. Let me, um, what's the best way to say this? Um, because what really matters here is kind of the pattern matching side of things. And the fact that we have essentially this data structure that's representing the hypergraph that we think is representing space, and we're operating on that hypergraph. And pure lambdas are kind of a, let's just eat function arguments, you know, as they come to us sort of one at a time, so to speak, rather than let's bite into this actual sort of structure that is the hypergraph and do things to that structure. I think that's probably my best. Um, I, I certainly thought about this question of whether we could somehow use, think about this as pure lambdas. Um, and I don't think it really makes sense because I think the pure lambdas are really that they actually, another way to think about it, I mean, pure lambdas tend to, you know, they eat one piece of food at a time, so to speak. They're, they're just going along, you know, and particularly if you've curried things, you've, gosh, that's a, that's a terrible food analogy right there. But um, uh, um, the, um, um, You've, um, you're just feeding to the lambda another, another expression, another expression, another expression. That's different from taking them out of a hypergraph to do things with them. Um, okay, Omar here. Uh, okay, this is, a, this is directed at you, Jonathan, which is good. How about the holographic principle? Any evidence from these multi-way processes of why quantum gravity could be described by a lower dimensional quantum field theory? Great, he's, he's sending that to you, so go, go for it. Okay, yeah, perfect. Um, so, okay, one sort of general point to make about these, these questions about connections to other theories. We've actually answered a bunch of these, Stephen and I, uh, for, the, for the Wolfram Physics website. So if you go to the Wolfram Physics Q&A part of the website, uh, there, there's a whole section about relations to other theories, and a lot of the ones that have come up, like loop quantum gravity, like things like the holographic principle, we, we have at least uh, sort of shortish uh, answers to those questions, which will no, uh, those will no doubt change as our understanding evolves, but at least at our present level of understanding, we, we have some, some answers there. So let me give a quick summary of, of how this relates to the holographic principle, and in particular to this idea of ADS-CFT correspondence, which is kind of the most concrete formulation, formulation of the holographic principle that we currently have, which is what emerges from string theory. So the, the basic idea with ADS-CFT correspondence is 
uh, ADS, that is anti it's a, gra a gravitation, a bulk gravitational theory in anti de Sitter space uh, in, in some D-dimensional some, some dimensional ADS uh, can be described effectively in terms of a conformal field theory uh, defined on a, a D minus one dimensional boundary to that bulk, a, to, to, the, to the bulk ADS region. And uh, this is a sort of a, a somewhat uh, bizarre kind of intuition breaking result in conventional physics. But actually, it's a very natural consequence of our models. And at least in toy cases, we can get sort of mini holographic principles appearing in our multi-way causal graphs. Let me give a, a brief summary sketch of how this works, and you can go, go see the Q&As for, for probably a better description. Um, so if you consider this fundamental structure, this multi-way causal graph, where, as I, as I mentioned earlier, you basically have, uh, you have causal, your, your directed edges represent causal connections uh, between updating events, not only on the same branch of history as in the standard space-time causal graph, but actually between different uh, diff different branches of history, right? And the, the kind of the, the general uh, intuitive claim is all the stuff we've talked about to do with relativity, that's to do with space-time causal graphs. And therefore those all concern the causal edges that connect events on the same, on, on a single branch of history. All the quantum results we've talked about with multi-way evolution effectively concern these different branches of history. So they're about the causal edges that connect these different branches of history. So now here's the point. Now imagine you wall, you, you, you take one of these bundles of causal edges that corresponds to a particular multi-way evolution branch and you draw effectively a wall around it. So now what you have are, are causal edges between different branches of evolution history flux being fluxed through this wall. And those are described by something like a conformal field theory on the boundary. But inside you have a single multi-way evolution branch, which is therefore a space-time causal graph described by general relativity. So you immediately have this notion of a, of, of a bulk uh, ADS uh, sort of gravitation theory inside this multi-way evolution branch being described in terms of fluxes of causal edges, uh, which we can think of in terms of conformal field theories through the, through the, bound, through the, through the D minus one dimensional boundary. And there are more precise versions of this. I, I um, give some details in my quantum mechanics paper about how this relates to things like the black hole information paradox, and relations between uh, sort of Bekenstein Hawking entropy and uh, entanglement entropy and other kinds of predictions that have been made from the holographic principle. But the, but the sort of the TLDR version is uh, the holographic principle is a very, very natural statement within our models, uh, basically because of the structure of the multi-way causal graph. Uh, let's see, there's a point about where people can send papers and so on. Yeah, I mean, people, people who are like, uh, you know, researching these various things like the holographic principle and so on, who uh, we'd love to hear from you. And um, there are lots of, lots of interesting relations to what we're doing that I think can be explored. Um, okay, so Eric Forgey is saying, please look at his 2002 dissertation about differential geometry in computational electrum and another one, 2004, about discrete differential geometry on causal graphs. Okay, that sounds that that title at least sounds highly relevant. So yes, we'll we'll um, uh, um, if you if you send mail um, on our website, there's a contact information um, link, and there's uh, if you if you send mail there, that will um, uh, that's sort of the the easiest way to communicate. Um, uh, okay, there's a question here. Who cares about peer review? Oh, don't get me started on that whole question. <laughs> I, I, you know, a sad fact, I, I haven't written, you know, this, this, I just sent in to uh, Archive the, um, the 450 page technical introduction to this project that I wrote. Um, and that is the first academic style paper that I've written since 1986. Um, and I was, uh, I realized uh, Paul Ginsberg, who started the archive preprint server, has been a friend of mine for a long time. And um, I had been asking Paul about how do I submit this paper? And he sent me back mail over last weekend saying 100,000 people have succeeded in submitting papers to archive. Uh, you know, and they gave me some details about what to do. So, so um, it was, uh, it's, uh, it's kind of, um, uh, you know, sadly when I, when I, did uh, physics for a living, so to speak. One of my heuristics was any truly sort of original idea could not get through peer review. Only incremental progress on things that already existed could. But um, uh, that, that's, that's, a, that's a perhaps overly cynical point of view. But um, uh, um, it's, um, uh, yeah. <laughs> 
let, let me not get started on that. That's a, that's a sociology of science issue, which um, um, which uh, uh, is, is probably not not pertinent to this. Um, okay, somebody is asking: Did did we solve the homework problem from the previous live stream? Does your theory uh, have a maximum temperature? So we did talk about that, and actually, I'm now trying to remember. The, the main conclusion was, yes, there's a maximum temperature. And the argument was pretty nice, and I'm actually forgetting it offhand. Jonathan, do you remember that argument? Yeah, yeah. So, so basically, um, how this works is, or how this might work, is uh, the, OK, obviously, temperature is some measure of average kinetic energy in, in, sort of over, over some region of space. And um, we have a, an immediate proxy for that in our causal graph, because we have this notion of momentum that Stephen was talking about earlier. So we have this notion that momentum is flux of causal edges through sort of vertical time-like hypersurfaces uh, in the causal graph. So basically the notion of the question of, is there an average temperature can really be recast in terms of, is there an average flux density uh, for causal edges beyond which, you know, the causal graph kind of falls apart or something. And actually the answer seems to be probably yes. Because if you have a flux density of causal edges through a time like hypersurface that's too high, it, it will basically it will it will cause that region of the causal graph to become causally disconnected for essentially the same reason as it does in, a, in, in a, if you try and uh, form a black hole by compressing too much matter into the same region of space. You get some some temperature theoretic uh, analog of, of a Schwarzschild radius where so you know if, if you try and compress too much energy into a region of space, that's again you're getting too much flux density of causal edges just through a space like hypersurface rather than through a time like one. And so we, so we have exactly the same thing. Basically, the, the phenomenon of, of um, the, the, this principle says, if you try and heat up a region of space beyond a certain temperature, it will inevitably collapse to something, uh, to something analogous to a black hole, and the causal graph will become disconnected. We haven't actually computed exactly what that is. It's, in, it's at a very, very high temperature. I suspect it'll probably be something of the order of the Planck temperature, because that's kind of the continuum analog of, of the same sort of phenomenon. But, uh, but yeah, the, the short answer is yes, there is some notion of a maximum temperature in our model. Right, but so, so why is it not the case that just in traditional general relativity, that um, you know there's a uh, you know when you have a certain amount of uh, of heat that corresponds to a certain T mu nu, and that you know in, in, if you have that amount of heat in some region, that's going to end up being a um, I mean just like in the traditional black hole uh, setup, you should be able to get that same you know you should. In, in, in continuum theories, you should get gravitational collapse if you have, so actually, I don't even know, but, but um, in, in sort of standard Bekenstein Hawking type thinking, is there a maximum temperature there? There should well, be. Yeah, there is, there is one that, that's, that's, that is this notion of a Planck temperature. So, this is, so the Planck temperature is this, is this fundamental see, temperature okay. that's a composition of, the, of, of G, H bar, C, and all these other units. And effectively, you know, one way you can think about that dimensional analysis is that it's the, it's the temperature beyond which uh, that region of space will effectively be contained within its Schwarzschild radius. Right. So the question is really, so I suspect we'll end up with the same kind of maximum temperature, um, although we might have some other interesting effects because because of this question that's more like the so-called Hagedorn temperature, which came up in particle physics, where you're just generating more and more different kinds of particles as you put more energy into, into a particular region. And that, I mean, that's, that's an interesting question, which depends on the spectrum of particles, which we don't know yet. OK. Um, Nike for us here. Is eternal recurrence at different space-time scales an inevitable conclusion of your theory? I don't think so. I mean, that would be some kind of fractal nested version of space-time, and I don't think we have that. Um, I don't think the, um, uh, yeah, I, I don't think there's a, a scale. Interesting question, whether there are, uh, to what extent there's scale invariance. I mean, there is, there is some effective field theory, some renormalization group sort of story about looking at effective, um, looking at the variation of the effective uh, uh, um, uh, evolution rule on different scales. But I don't think that any, in any direct way that there's a, a sort of a recurrence of that type. Um, okay, Hugo Lini is asking in the blog article, you add the causal dependencies to the ABBB graph. Can you walk through a few of those dependencies to clarify their meaning? Okay, let's take a look at that. 
By the way, Stephen, just one thing. A bunch of people are telling me that we need to transition to the philosophy stream very oh, soon. Oh, wow. Okay, all right. Okay, okay, okay. Well, then... Um, uh, okay. Let's, let's hold on a second then. Um, all right. Wow, we've got so many interesting questions here. All right, so so we'll have to pick that up another time. I'm sorry. Well, actually, it'd be really good to... Let, let's just... Since somebody is trying to read something in detail, let's just very quickly try and go through that. Or maybe we can take that offline and somebody can, can explain that. Um, we should be able to really go through that in, in detail. Um, all right. Well, listen, this is great, guys, and uh, much appreciated. And, um, uh, you know, we'll do a round two. Um, it's, uh, 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 yeah, um, that's good. All right. So for people who are interested, we will be transitioning to a totally different um, uh, kind of strand of things talking about the philosophy of, of uh, the implications of these things for philosophy. And before that, I need a bite to eat. So see you guys soon. Thanks for joining us. Okay. Bye.